Okay, well, thank you very much for coming along this morning. Um, yeah, our story in Jersey uh, starts in 2012 with the discovery of this coin hoard by two local metal detectorists, uh, Bridge Mead and Richard Miles. Uh, they have been told about some coins being found in a field in Jersey in the 1980s, but the person couldn't be very specific about where they were. They looked at a number of fields and began to find coins which had been ploughed up and down a field uh, early 2012. Um, they brought them in and we cleaned some of them and we could see that they were um, first century BC French uh, Celtic coins from a tribe called the uh, Corioceliti who are quite close to us on the uh, Brittany coast. Um, they then brought a deep seeking machine back to the site which could see further down and uh, got a very large signal, um, dug a very thin sort of hole down and hit a hard surface, scraped up a few more of these coins so they realised they'd found a hoard. Um, they then got in touch with us at Jersey Heritage at that stage and we uh, assembled a team of local archaeologists and myself as a conservator um, and went to excavate what we assumed was the bottom half of a pot at that stage. And we kind of thought we'd be in and out on a day. So we just dug a sort of two metre square hole here, uh, went down and on the first day we uncovered, it's actually slightly bright to see some this way, but perhaps if we could, can we lose a light closer to this perhaps? Or not. Anyway, yeah, we can see. <laughs> I may just do this by braille virtually, but you can see that there's a sort of green. Hey, hey we're back. Next one. That's odd. It's jumped by itself. Uh, yeah, there's a mass of sort of green coins here. We assumed, as I say, it was a small pot. Even by this stage, after digging, uh, and perhaps an hour after seeing the first coin, we realised that it was just spreading out. So we had to get security in to guard the site at night um, and after about three days excavation we got all our sections and things out of the way here but you can see the size of the hoard basically a mass of coins and as it turns out jewellery one meter forty by seventy centimeters fifteen centimeters deep sixty nine thousand three hundred and seventy coins plus jewellery and so forth the worry at this stage became how we just got the thing out of the ground uh, because it was hundreds of kilos by this stage we realized and we didn't know how, how strong it was because it was only basically um, held together by the corrosion from the silver copper coins um, holding it together uh, what we did in the end at my suggestion was we then dug about 20 centimeters below the actual bottom edge of the coin we dug a series of four tunnels underneath it uh, i made a structure out of scaffold which fits around the outside and then we used uh, nylon sort of sort of uh, strops which you can like crank down to go under those holes then the scary bit was we actually slightly moved the hoards till we knew that the earth connection was was broken and it was just the weight and we were able to pick the thing up by crane because it was only about eight meters or so actually from the road fortunately the crane driver said it weighed over a ton when it came out with with the earth underneath uh, we managed by that stage to get some support underneath as well Took it back to one of our secure sites. Uh, you can see it's sort of still wrapped from the dig. At this stage, because we knew there was silver there, it was declared tre um, treasure trove. Uh, and we were asked at Jersey Heritage to actually um, essentially find out what this was. So we did an initial <coughs> evening, and we say me and I. Um, I cleaned off a sort of 15 centimeter wide strip along the surface and down one side and we began to find silver and gold jewelry even in that first strip as well i then cleaned around and you can see the whole sort of cross section of the hoard there still holding together and the entire object once the majority of the earth was offered and it was at that stage we could do our first estimates of coin numbers and so forth amazing object we knew it was the first time Anybody had got an object like this out of the ground, essentially, in one piece. And it obviously gave us the chance to do a micro-excavation of the object itself in a way that hadn't been done before. So we were determined to record it as well as we could. There was then a period of about 18 months of negotiations between the government in Jersey and the Crown about funding and permissions. 
but we eventually got funding to do a three-year project to disassemble, uh, conserve and record the, the hoard. Um, we wanted to get this done in the face of the sort of public as much as possible, so we built what we referred to as the open lab, which is a sort of glass-walled laboratory in the middle of a big exhibition about the... We did an exhibition about the hoard itself and the dig and this sort of period. Um, and for three years, we actually did the work taking the hoard apart and recording it. And I will hand over to my colleagues to describe some of the more actual te technical side of the work. So the hoard itself was actually um, too big to x-ray, so other than what Neil's already shown you, we had no idea what was inside it. So there was a debate about taking it apart at all. So that's how partly how we came to the point of deciding to record it in this way using the 3D technology we're going to talk to you about. Um, so this is me using the six axis furrow edge metrology arm, um, which is what we use to record each coin and any other object we found. And another person would use the Geomagic software to monitor the results that we came on the screen. Um, so this is the point probe end of the Faro edge arm, and as you can see, it, it comes into contact with the coin surface itself. Um, the Geomagic software <coughs> provided us with a variety of different shape options, so we could record the objects in the best way we saw fit. So for coins, we picked a circle, surprise, so surprise. Um, and to do that, um, to, to record a coin, you need to take six point, oops, sorry, that's a bit weird, uh, three points across the middle for the diameter, and three on the outside for the circumference, which creates, as you can see, a circle on the screen. Um, it's allocated the next sequential number. So at this point, we gave the coin and the circle the same unique number. And this is how we kept a running total of how many coins were removed. Um, I think at the moment we have an approximate number of about 69,370-ish. Um, the technology was good enough to clearly re reflect the three different sizes of coin we had in the hoard. The stator, which is the size of a 10p, the quarter stator, which is the size of a 5p, and a putty beyond, which is even smaller than that. Um, so yeah, as Neil said, we treated the, 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 the dismantling of the hoard um, as a micro-excavation. So we began in an organic rich area so we could remove and preserve as many samples as possible. And then we worked our way around the hoard bit by bit, um, taking it down in approximate layers. Um, so to record the talks we found, so this is just some of them, um, we used the circle function on the Geomagic software for the complete ones that you can see, and a line for the talks where their core had been removed, which only left the decorative sheet gold. Um, another way we used the Geomagic shape functions was to create a control to align all of our scans together. So this is a stainless steel object we refer to as spheres. Uh, which we um, added into the mud underneath the hoard itself as this was the most stable position we could find. It meant that we could align all of our scans together so we have one complete model of the entire hoard. So unfortunately that model is too large to show you today, but here is just a snapshot of one of our scans. Um, it's approximately 800 coins, and as you can see, we've got the speed in there as well. What's fantastic about the software is we can see the original orientation of all the coins or we can rotate it to see everything from a completely different perspective. We also created a database of all the coins and other objects, as much detail as we possibly could fit in. So everything's photographed as well, and all accessible online. So if anyone is interested in looking at particular coins, it's all available. But what we'd like to do is merge our complete scan together with our database records to just open up a completely different view of the composition and the construction of the hoard. Um, so, for example, it would be a lot easier to see where all the talks were placed and whether or not there was any patterns there, um, as well as there's different tribes represented in the horde, whether in particular areas or whether they're completely all mixed together. Um, yeah, so watch this space, really. We're definitely looking into further research on that. So I'm now going to pass you over to Vicky, who's going to tell you the sort of what I refer to as the flashier side of our 3D recording. So a second aspect of the recording process was to produce laser scans of the hoard surface um, to create 3D models. Um, again, we used the, the metrology arm and the geomagic software to do this, but we changed it to the laser handle, which you can see. In the image. Apparently, you can scan faces if you really want to. Great fun. <laughs> Uh, one of the main reasons for scanning it in this way was to give us an additional dimension to the recording process. Um, and it will allow digital reconstructions that we can use in our interpretation 
um, and also in um, future displays of the archaeology, so in exhibitions if we can print out models for different, different stages of the process. Um, we were also able to uh, record every object in situ just to help our understanding. Um, before any object was removed, we did a 3D scan of that object in the surrounding area just to see how it was positioned in the hoard and any other objects that it was directly related to. Um, the video that was playing as I was talking just shows how we were collecting the data and there's a screen grab of the Geomagic software so it just shows us the view that we had. Um, and our control spheres were also used again, as Georgia explained, to align those together. So we had to laser scan half of the hoard, move the scanner, scan the other half of the hoard, um, so we could be able to use those spheres to tie those two together. This is just to show you a scan in motion, so this is how it came up as we were recording it. Um, we were able to rotate this image so that we can see any gaps in our data and go back over those areas to try and get as good a resolution and picture as possible. We also took digital photos um, at every stage, so um, we could add texture onto our scans as well. So we scanned it before any coins were removed, and then again every few months as objects started to appear, and we always took images to go with those scans. Um, so to do this, all of our raw data was converted into the polygon mesh, and we were able to fill in any of the smaller holes that were in our data to try and get a complete picture. Um, to overlay the photographs, we had to split the screen. So you'd have a scan on one side and the image on the other side. Um, and you'd have to try and directly match the coin on the image to the coin on the scan. So as you can probably imagine, it's easier when we had objects. <laughs> you have to do about 10 points on each to overlay the picture properly. Um, this video is the closest that we have to a complete scan at this stage, but with 69 plus coins, we did have our hands full a little bit. Um, the great thing about laser scanning it in this way is that it's now stored in our archives. So we have all of the images and all of the scans. So it's definitely something that we can work on in the future to build more sophisticated models. And we're hoping that um, in the future, these two archives will be worked on a bit more and put together properly. So I'll hand you back to Neil because he's just going to sum up where we are now. Yes. Yeah, um, just in terms of where we are at the moment, uh, we had a three-year project of the dates there till early this year to actually take the whole thing apart. Um, it seemed to take a lot longer than this gives the impression, but yeah, we can see the objects coming apart here and the surprises we had as we were going through it. When we began this, we assumed that everything was going to be done in this discrete sort of three-year period, including the research required. But um, it became apparent pretty much as soon as we began just how important the object w was and the potential that there was there uh, for research far more than we'd assumed at, at the beginning. <laughs> See the dinosaur, I assume. <laughs> um, we hadn't anticipated the amount of organic material we, we would find uh, deep inside the hoard, right down to sort of leaves, like a fern leaf in this case arthropods, um, all sorts of things. So we were taking uh, a lot more samples and realized that there was more uh, potential for research there than we'd realized. Um, last year, we had uh, a research conference where we got a lot of people in to suggest what they thought should be done further than we already had. Uh, and we've come up with now, as it were, a second sort of three-year proposal, which we're actually hoping to fund now. Um, a lot of it about the objects other than the coins that have been found. So we've done some x-ray and x-ray fluorescence and so forth already on the jewellery and so forth. But we'd like to go further, find out where the, the metals came from, a lot about techniques of making and so forth. Um, there's something just a little bit picture of the x-ray refraction we've already done. Um, so yeah, we're now hoping to get equivalent funding again. The first three-year project was funded at about a quarter of a million pounds, and we we're asking for slightly less than that again to do joint collaborative research with universities and other bodies, uh, both here in Britain and also in France. Um, we're waiting for an answer on that. In the absence of that, we will continue a lower scale of research that we can fund ourselves and try and get other projects going. So yeah, that's kind of where we are now. So that's us. Thank you very much.